thank you everyone very much for uh, having me today. Hopefully you can see my screen and I've now got my Slack open. So uh, let's, uh, let's have a chat, shall we? Right now I'm actually in Las Vegas at a uh, dev intersection. So this is the first time that I've presented at two conferences in one day, which I think is pretty cool. We're at Dev Trinity and Dev Intersections, which is super fun. All right, so I'm gonna talk about um, what is the difference between mentorship and sponsorship and then how this can build your career with empathy, which I think is super important. Now, I put together these slides, but then our friends uh, at Dev Trinity told me that these, this font is Comic Sans, this is unprofessional. So then I had to repair my PowerPoint, I had to fix my font. So I put in a more professional font. Um, but then the conference organizers said that it's not professional and nice to have just a white background. So I had to make a much more high quality background. So I got some, uh, some quality stock photography of a developer's desk. So this is what I think a typical developer's desk looks like. Isn't this what your desk looks like, my friends? Um, it, it's not. This is an awful desk. This is the kind of desk that they show you when you're a, uh, an, you know, an influencer, and they tell you that people uh, have a desk like this. But I think maybe a more typical developer's desk maybe looks like this. But in fact, whatever your desk looks like is what a developer's desk looks like. I think what's important is that you be intentional and you be deliberate and focused on what your desk looks like. So if this kind of desk makes you happy, if it makes you feel like you're doing your best work, that's great. If this desk makes you happy and this is how you're gonna do your best work, then that's okay too. I said that this is what a real developer's desk looks like. And I think we need to stop saying stuff like that. Uh, any developer who is doing good work and enjoying themselves and shipping product is a real developer, regardless of whether their desk looks like this or whether it looks like this. It doesn't matter. We want you all to feel welcome. There was a time when I didn't feel super welcome in tech, and I felt a little bit like maybe I was in over my head. I didn't go to a good school. Um, I went to a trade school uh, here in the US that was uh, called a community college. And then I would go to places like Microsoft or Intel or Nike, and I would meet people who went to real schools, and I would feel like less than. And we want to make sure that everyone in tech is feeling welcome and feeling like they're supposed to be here. And this is a big part of thinking about one's attitude and one's style. A lot of us who are here at the conference are... Um, or maybe senior engineers, engineers that are a little farther along in their, um, in their career. And it's important for us to set the tone for how new early in career people are gonna um, find this industry. A lot of times you're seeing influencers, people on TikTok and people on uh, Twitter and social media with a very aggressive, just do it, we're not working hard enough. If you're gonna be, successful in tech, you're gonna to need to work harder. And um, I get working hard is good, working hard is important and fun, but I think that this kind of hustle culture is not healthy. You're not going to win in tech by hurting yourself. And by hurting yourself, I mean 60, 80, 100 hour weeks, pounding your head against the wall. This is not a welcoming and comfortable uh, environment. Remember that We've now got Stack Overflow, we've got Google, we've got blogs, we've got these AIs. This is supposed to make our lives easier. It's not supposed to turn us all into 10X developers. Remember that productivity has a limit and managing your health and um, managing your family life makes you stick around in tech for a long time. I've been in tech now for 30 years and three months. And my dad is always checking on me to make sure that I'm okay. And he says, you're no good to us dead. That's kind of a weird, morbid way that dads, I think, talk. My dad is a firefighter, so he is not a techie. He knows how to put out fires of wood houses here in the U.S. And he always says, you're no good to me dead. And what he's saying there is, please don't hurt yourself. Please don't work too hard in tech. So I want to make sure that everyone feels welcome. 
this is the kind of tech environment that I grew up in. This is a real magazine from March of 1984. And in March of 1984, I could go to a store and I could buy a magazine with this young lady on the cover. And she's programming a Texas Instruments 99 slash four portable computer. And she felt welcome in tech. And I think everyone should feel that comfortable. And we wanna make sure that we're not chasing people away. The reason that I mentioned that I've been, tech, I've been in tech for 30 years is that that happened because I wasn't chased out by toxic jerks. I felt welcome and the work was interesting and the stuff I was working on <clears throat> was interesting. Think about how many people we know who have left tech because they didn't feel like they were doing good work or that they couldn't do be themselves or their bosses were jerks. Now, you hear a lot of talk right now in tech about inclusion and diversity. Um, some people don't like this talk. They think that it's artificial. And I wanna talk about artificial diversity. This is like some kids' cartoons that you see uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. This is artificial diversity where they just pick one kid of each color. And that's not really what we're talking about. And we hear things like these quotes where diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. What we can do as senior engineers is we can make sure that people are not just going to a party, they're a member of the party planning committee. So rather than um, focusing too much on the, uh, the diversity of it, think about what it truly means to be inclusive. That's the word, because diversity happens if inclusion happens, it happens naturally. Um, inclusion, is the opposite of exclusion. So if you're doing something accidentally or you know, on purpose that excludes somebody, stairs versus ramps is a perfect example where if I've got stairs, I can't get my wheelchair up. I've accidentally excluded someone and in doing that, we're not being inclusive. So we try to make sure that everyone feels welcome. And these things can be invisible. Uh, I happen to be a type one diabetic. A lot of people know that. Some people don't. I actually have a, an insulin pump plugged into my arm right here. And that insulin pump is invisible. As soon as I put my shirt down, you don't have to worry about it. And it doesn't affect my work on a day-to-day -day basis, but it does affect my travel. So I feel included when I show up at a conference and they have, you know, Diet Coke. It's a small thing, but it's an acknowledgement that we're not gonna give you a bowl of M&Ms and uh, a bunch of uh, regular Coke. Those tiny things make people feel included. So I went and I made an Xbox avatar that people can buy so that kids can see that they are the same. And those small things make people feel included because what we've done in technology is we have created a priesthood. A priesthood is referring to the way that we thought about priests thousand years ago, 1500 years ago. And by that, I mean, they knew how to read the book and they would tell the people in the streets, the plebs, the plebeians, hey, we've got this book. It's a very special book. I want, don't, don't, don't touch it. Just look, look at the book. I'll read the book to you. And the priests would have knowledge. And as we know, knowledge is power and it tends to be hoarded. So what you can do as someone who's 5, 10, 15 years into your career is you can make sure that the next generation of person feels welcome and they don't feel like you are um, keeping the knowledge from them. And there was a, there was a TV show here in the U.S. Uh, called Saturday Night Live. And many, many years ago, Saturday Night Live had a character on it called Nick Burns, your company's computer guy. If you go out and Google or Google with Bing for Nick Burns, your company's computer guy, you'll see that it's actually a very young Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy Fallon is a famous uh, talk show host here in the US. And what Nick Burns would do is he would come in and be tech support for your company and he would make everyone feel really bad. So you would see famous people come on the show like Jennifer Aniston from Friends and she'd say, hey, Nick, I can't get my printer to work. And Nick would go, move. And that was, his, that was his line, move. And he would shove you out of the way. And then he'd go, stop, stop, stop. And he'd go, was that so hard? And then they would play the music. 
And why was it funny? It was funny because that was how people acted back then. They made you feel dumb about getting the printer to work, about getting the internet to, to, to dial up or whatever. So we don't want to be Nick Burns, the stereotypical, uh, how dumb is it to reverse a bubble, a doubly linked list with a bubble store? Don't make people feel like that. Nobody likes that. We don't mean to do it though, I think. We just do it accidentally. So what we need to do is be, as I said before, intentional, deliberate. We don't want to be gatekeeping. Gatekeeping are the people who stand at the gate and they keep the rest of us from learning information. They control information flow. This is a great point. Here's a, a comment here from Dejan saying, continuous, considering how ubiquitous tutorials and videos and blogs are out there, everyone's trying to get internet points by sharing what they know. Is this still relevant today? I think it is. I think it is relevant because saying that uh, the information is available uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's getting to the right people. Not everything is easily found in a Google search. There are discords, there are slacks with people. Hey, there are discords and slacks with people in them that uh, are making other folks not feel welcome. Did you have a question or do you want to chime in? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> so basically, I show up, yeah. <laughs> um, so there is a question from the audience uh, considering how yeah, I was the just tutorials, videos, blogs, and other ways of sharing knowledge are. Um, it seems like then everybody's is trying to, yeah. It seems like everybody's trying to score internet poets by sharing what they know. Is it still relevant today? Mm -hmm. I think I think it is. I think that just saying that the material's there, why can't you learn it? Isn't enough. We have to have materials of different levels. We have to recognize that not everyone speaks English, right? Like, what if I, as a native English speaker in the U.S., I'm like, hey, I did a tutorial on ASP.NET. I did it in really fast American English. How hard is that? That doesn't make a person who speaks English as their third or fourth language feel welcome. So we need information in native languages. We need information at different paces. We need tutorial tutors and teachers to sit alongside you and help you and guide you to that next thing. We need workshops and courses. We need slacks and discords and places to discuss this material. And when you show up there, you feel welcome. And if you're the only, the only woman, the only non-English speaker, the only person of color, the only old person, the only whatever, anytime you're the only, it's kind of weird when you walk into a room and you go, yikes, am I supposed to be here? And you want people to go, yeah, come on in, let's do this, let's have fun together. So just saying that the tutorials are, um, are available isn't enough. And another great point I see here in the Slack from Andy saying that mm -hmm. technical jargon is another thing. We call them TLAs. You know what TLA stands for? Um. <laughs> See? So I was teasing you because I just used a three-letter acronym to make you feel like you should know that. Because your first reaction was, um, am I supposed to know that? Is, like, is that like DNS? Just made it up. It's a three-letter acronym. There's all kinds of words like that that are made to make people feel bad. So when you're in a meeting and someone uses a TLA that you've never heard about, do you feel comfortable as the most junior person on the team to go and speak up and go, I'm sorry, what is DNS again? I'm sorry, what does that mean? Because you're afraid that someone's gonna go, ah, oh, this guy, how dumb are you? Nobody wants to feel like that. So when we hear about safe spaces, and people are negative, like it's very political right now. People are like, I don't, you, don't need no, you don't need a safe space, suck it up. It sucks to not know stuff. So what we can do is, as, as people who are more advanced in our career is we can help them. You can always chat me and ask me what the three letter acronym is or what's that word, what's that jargon? So I think Andy and Dojan make a really great point in the chat there. And I think also Andy Reeves points out that a lot of time isn't knowing the, it's not the answer, it's not knowing the right question to ask. If you don't know the right, and I'm gonna talk about that actually. So I love these questions and thanks for popping in. And let me know if you see another great question and pop in again, all right? Sure. I love it. All right, cool. I disappear. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, my friend. Yeah, so um, sharing your energy is what we can do as people who are a little farther along in our career. We put out good work. 
We don't waste our keystrokes. I'm gonna talk about that. And we try to be kind. Here's the trick though. Being kind takes effort. It takes energy. And sometimes I wake up and I'm in a bad mood. I uh, put some things on TikTok a couple of days ago about chat GPT and TikTok just beat the crap out of me. They were very mean and unkind and it tell you that it really made me sad. I had almost 200,000 video views on what I thought was an extremely reasonable and measured opinion about AI and uh, a bunch of mean people disagreed and that's depressing. But if you put out kind energy, the energy will come back to you. I am convinced about it. And I think that things like hustle culture, where we're just telling people, well, if you don't get it, work harder. It's always good advice to work hard, but working hard is not the answer to solving these problems. And I think we need to remind ourselves of that. Why do people need to suffer? I think Samuel makes a great point in the chat. Does everyone else have to suffer like I have? This is the thing, we've achieved something and now I'm gonna turn around and say, now you have to do it all in assembler. And then you have to do it in C. You don't get a garbage collector until you've learned how to suffer like I suffered. There's no reason for that, no reason for that. Now we're in a time, of course, that's stressful. We're remote. I wish I could be there in person with you, but remote work and quarantine work are all very different. We're kind of maybe coming out of COVID, but there's still people that can't uh, go places. So one good thing that's come out of uh, COVID is, is being able to do conferences like this and be in a hybrid environment. Um, but we still have this pressure to overwork. And this pressure to overwork is a huge problem. I know that I've been remote now for Microsoft for 15 years. However, in doing that, I have felt more pressure to overwork and work harder, even though I'm already remote since remote work started because of uh, these environments. And we're working on that at work. And I hope that your company is working on it as well. But even last night here at Vegas, getting ready to talk at this conference, getting ready to talk with you friends at the fraternity, I'm still doom scrolling. I'm just at night on my phone, scrolling for doom. It's climate change, it's politics, it's prisoner swaps, it's the worst stuff. And it just gets me depressed. So I'm trying to focus, as my dad told me, you're no good to us dead, on being as deliberate and intentional and present as possible. I love it, Andy says he's trying to find the non-doom. That's the way, scroll for happiness. That's the good move, that's the good move. So in trying to be intentional and in trying to be present, I'm trying to make a space for myself to um, do my best work. Now, even though I'm at a hotel in an unfamiliar place and you can see the sun is rising here behind me, um, I'm trying to make space. Hey, friend. <laughs> Hi again. <laughs> so, uh... There's another question uh, that programming is intensive. How do you differentiate be uh, between hard work and being overworked? That is a brilliant question. I love that question. Thank you, because that question fits perfectly into what I'm about to talk about. Hard work, in my opinion, feels good. You feel like you've accomplished something. You feel positive about it. You say, I know this is hard and I'm excited about it. And at the end, we celebrate the team and we say, we worked hard and look at our achievement. We were rewarded, we felt good about it and we shipped that thing. Overworked is when you go home and you feel like crap. And you're like, I don't know what this company does. I don't know why I'm doing this. They don't pay me enough. This sucks, everything sucks. Hard work is enjoyable. It's hard, but it does. And I love what Andy said. Andy says, if you cry afterwards, it's overwork. That is a brilliant answer. Don't you think that's brilliant? Cool, it's really amazing. Yeah, I don't cry about hard work, but I do cry about overwork. And in doing that, I try to make a space for myself. So I'm a big fan of what's called nesting. I love your background. Are you in your kid's room or yep. is this your space? Yeah, so just, uh, I don't really broadcast that much. So just, I have to <laughs> take see, all the space great, available. <laughs> but it's a space though that you've made that's special, right? So yeah. I have this picture here, which is my office where I've made a space that's for me and you have a space for your, for your kids. And these are spaces that make us happy. They feed our spirit because we made them nesting doesn't just happen. Even though I'm in this hotel, I've made a nest. 
I've brought the things I need, the cables that I want. I brought my secondary monitor. I've got my favorite mouse, my new Logitech vertical mouse. I, I, Michael is asking where the Commodore 64 is. It's right here, right? I, you, you oh, thought you got me there, Mikhail. I'm right here. I got it. So I brought everything I needed to make my space, my space here. And this allows me to decide, is this the time for me to create, for me to do stuff? And that is uh, important to me. So great questions here. I see another one here from Samira. Yeah. 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 How ahead, do we it. balance helping people and encouraging them to look for answers, make effort at solving the issues themselves? I love that question. I love that question. I think the challenge is, uh, and I, I'll use the example of my 14-year-old. Um, last night from, from here in Las Vegas, I called to Portland and I did a Zoom with my 14-year-old who's working on some physics homework. He's doing vectors in physics for his freshman year. And um, I felt a little bit while I was tutoring him that I was doing the work. So you have to catch yourself because we did Zoom and I got my, my touch screen and my pen and I started drawing on the whiteboard. And then I was like, I think I'm doing this problem for you. Why don't you take over and do some of this work? You have to catch yourself. If you're mentoring someone, you're giving them hints, but if you're, and you're teaching them, you're giving them tools, but if you're just doing the work, uh, they're gonna end up not knowing how to, how to do it themselves. So I think that's a great question. The balance is by paying attention. It's also worth pointing out that everyone is an expert at something. So even if they're new, they're gonna be an expert at something. Uh, they're gonna be an expert at being new. They're gonna be an expert at whatever culture or place that they came from, or maybe they're an expert in a different topic. We have to figure out what those things are so we can make those people shine. All right, good stuff. Good questions. I love that we have such an active active group here. This is fantastic. And oh, there is one the more. Yeah, please. There is one more. How to encourage people to help each other? In other words, how to motivate people to be a mentor? I love that. I love that question. You make them watch this talk and you go out yourself and you tell them why it's important. That's why. Everyone who is in this chat with us right now is thinking about these kinds of things. And if you then go and you tell your friends, you know, I need to spend more time giving back. This is a great opportunity. So you are the beginning. Just by asking that question, you're starting to be a mentor yourself. One of the things that I mentioned before was the idea of conserving your keystrokes. Let's say that someone in the chat sends me a, a question after the talk. They have a comment after the talk. And I say, um, you know, that's a great question, but I don't know you. You could, let's say you email me after, right? Let's say you personally. I go, hey, great talk, thanks a lot. Here's a question. Like, we, we know each other, but we don't know each other that well. Am I gonna spend an hour writing you a whole paragraph and multiple paragraphs of answering the question? And then afterwards you say, thanks. Where did those keystrokes go? So I like to say that you have a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. That's a very dark way to phrase it. But it's really important because it lets you think about how you're gonna spend your time. I'm gonna actually go to a website that I made called keysleft.com. And you can go here now if you want and you can put in how old you are and how fast you type. And it will actually calculate how many keystrokes you have left before you die. And you can actually see how the number is going down in real time as we're sitting here. And what this means is it calculates how long you're gonna live and it tells you what you could spend your time on. Do you wanna spend your time writing a million emails to your boss? Or do you wanna write love letters or novels or tweets or computer programs? You have to think about what you're going to do with your time. So what you can do to encourage new people in tech is when they ask you a question, you can give them the gift of an answer. However, if you email it back to them, you're wasting your keystrokes. Where should your keystrokes go? They should go anywhere with a URL, a blog, a SharePoint, a OneNote, a tweets, uh, anything, as long as they don't go in email because email even though we think it's searchable, it's really not. So if someone in the chat here decides to email me after the talk, 
I'm probably not going to email you back the answer because I don't know you and I'm not going to give you all thousand keystrokes. But if the question is a great question, then that question itself was a gift. So maybe I do need to answer it. So I'm going to write a blog post or a, or a tweet or a whatever, a TikTok. I'm going to send you a link to it. And then I'm going to go to sleep. And then I'm going to wake up and 10 other people saw it. That's like I sent emails to 10 different people with the, with the answer. Those keystrokes then got multiplied. And what we can do to the points that, uh, that Andre and other folks were saying in the chat is we can encourage other people to share their information because we're all just amateurs. We're all just figuring this out. There's no professionals. Uh, I told you I went to school 30 years ago. Every language that I learned, they're gone. I, every operating system that I studied in school, they're all dead. None of them exist anymore. So we have to ask ourselves, what does experience really mean? Sometimes people will tell you stuff like, oh, do you have 20 years experience? Or do you have the same year's experience 20 times? That's a really deep question. I want you to think about that. Each of you in the chat there may have 5, 10, 15, 20 years experience. You know how many years you have. How many years were you actually awake and learning and excited about your job and working hard but not overworking versus years where you just kind of phoned it in? I've been working for 30 years. I would say for about seven of them, depending, you know, mixed around in the 30, I wasn't really paying attention. I was doing the work, but I didn't grow. But then when I started focusing more on being deliberate and being intentional and being present, I feel like I got better and I learned more. So we don't want to be using the idea of years experience as a way to tell people that they suck or they don't suck. So during the pandemic, uh, just as a, as a personal note, my family and I over the last four years have become, uh, we got our black belts in Taekwondo. So I'm now what's called a first Don black belt in Taekwondo. But the man who taught me is a ninth Don. He's been doing it since 1968. So I felt like I'd achieved something. I'm black belt. You can't tell me anything, right? That's the attitude you have. I got, I got 30 years experience. I'm the man. I'm a first Don. I just got started at a black belt. So I thought I had ended something, but he reminded me, now the work starts. Now that you have a black belt, we can actually do some interesting and interesting work. And I think that's a very humble thing to, to think about. This gentleman here, do we know who this gentleman is, my friends? This is Tim Berners-Lee. He invented the World Wide Web, okay? Notice Tim Berners-Lee's title. What is his title? Web developer. Everyone wants to be a senior web developer or a principal or a staff engineer. But Tim Berners-Lee just said web developer. You know what he didn't say? You know what he could have said? He could have said the the web developer. Can you imagine someone giving you a business card? You meet them at a party or at a conference and they go, oh yeah, what's your name? Oh, Tim Berners-Lee. Here's my card. Oh, the web developer. The, yeah, I made it. That was me. But he doesn't do that because the web is bigger than Berners-Lee and he recognizes that he's never too old to get good advice. So this is another important thing. Even though I'm old and I've been doing tech for many, many years, I recognize that I too could use a mentor. So I want people to realize that I'm not just saying for, hey, young people, go find mentors. Hey, old people, go mentor young people. I'm saying we need to start pairing up. We need to start pairing up because I recognize that it's, I'm not too old to get good advice. I don't know Kubernetes as much as maybe a young person might. So I'll go find myself a young person to help teach me Kubernetes. And then I can go and share my experiences with the next generation. And I say old and young, but I really could mean early in career and late in career, because we also have our friends who are um, entering, entering software as older people. So they're career switchers. So it doesn't necessarily mean the 40 year olds and the 20 year olds. But one of the things that I caught myself doing that I think is important to point out is when I was mentoring early on, I had done it, I'd done it wrong. I did mentoring incorrectly. I was mentoring people as if it were a weekly lecture from an old person. 
So I would meet with the young engineer and the relationship was not like this. It was like this. Here's the young person, here's me. So I would, I would, I would lecture them regularly and tell them about my experience and tell them, oh, this is how you should do things. And that, you know, I'm right because I'm old. And that's not a good attitude. That's not a good thing to do. And in doing that, I was making them feel less than. So then I started realizing that mentorship is a spectrum. And I needed to define what mentorship meant for me and that particular person. So mentors in this definition here are these mirrors. It's like a version of yourself in the future. And then they can help you define your dream. They actually focus on you and your strengths. They advise you, they give you advice. They don't just lecture you. Now, there's a new word I want you to think about. It's called sponsorship. And sponsorship is where we need to focus because they've done a lot of um, um, surveys and a lot of um, you know, questionnaires and they've found that people who are mentored feel over mentored. They've got all the mentorship that they need, but what they really need are sponsorship. They need to be brought into new spaces. So a lot of people don't like the word luck. They feel like luck is, um, is a problem word. Um, and they don't recognize what luck means in their career. Because we, I think as people, particularly software engineers, we wanna be able to say, well, I'm, I'm good. And I got here because I'm good. And then when someone starts saying words like privilege, you're like, ah, oh, but that, you know, I worked hard here. I, I busted my ass to get where I'm at. And here's the thing, both things can be true. So I started thinking about what it means to be lucky because sometimes I'll say stuff like, I'm very lucky to have had a good career in tech. I'm very lucky to be at Microsoft. I'm very lucky to be, you know, have a, have a career of many years and that I'm reasonably well thought of in the space. And people are like, well, don't say lucky. You're downplaying your hard work. So what is luck, my friends? Luck is being prepared plus opportunity. I was ready. The opportunities presented themselves. That was luck. But imagine all the people who are ready. They're doing the boot camps. They're studying. They're graduating from school. But economic conditions, where they came from, whatever, is preventing the opportunities from presenting themselves. So they don't have enough in that equation. Luck equals being prepared plus opportunity. So what can we do? This is important. So bear with me. I want to hear what you think in the chat. I, as an old person in tech with a certain rank, meaning my level at the company is pretty high, uh, can make luck. If there's people out there who are prepared, I can create luck by giving them opportunities. All I have to do is put them in a new space. And by that, I mean I can sponsor them, not just mentor them and meet with them. We can do strategies and stuff, but I can give them opportunities, okay? I can give them opportunities. I can advocate for them. I can talk well of them when they're not in the room. So if there's an opportunity to go and you know, give a presentation, I can say, hey, you should, uh, you should call Andy. You should call Dejan. You, know, you should call... Uh, you know, whoever, and give a, give a talk. Oh, you know, there's a conference going on called Eternity. You know, Samira would be great. Or you should call Taha. They could give a talk at this conference. And then by doing that, I've lent, I've lent my privilege, which I have an unlimited amount of, because I'm, you know, an old guy in tech. You can do this as well. Is there a person at work who's great, doing great work, and you just need to maybe put him in front of the VP? or let the engineering manager know that they're doing well. So if you do something small and say, hey, you know, Vitaly did great work on this, uh, on this conference. You should, uh, you know, kudos to Vitaly and the team. Didn't cost you anything, cost you nothing. And then you just lent your position to them and then brought them into a new space. So when you're thinking about a new person that you wanna spend time with, that you wanna mentor, are you there to strategize with them? Are you there to teach them tech? That's cool, that's one relationship. 
Other things you can do are give opportunities. You can let them talk to you on LinkedIn. You can recommend them for a job. You can say, rather than me giving the talk to the vice president, maybe the new person should give the talk to the vice president. It's also worth acknowledging that mentorship is not forever. So when you're starting to mentor someone, you can set it up and say, all right, why are we doing this? Are we trying to get you promoted to senior engineer? That's cool. All right, let's put together a three month plan on how we get you promoted. Or let's put together a one year plan about how we learn Kubernetes, or let's do whatever and make it a phase. And then just like a sprint, like a mentorship sprint. And at the end of that sprint, we can ask ourselves, was this successful? We don't have to be together forever. We're gonna mentor in phases. And that in that way, mentorship becomes a two-way street as opposed to a regularly scheduled lecture from an old guy, which is what I uh, was doing originally. And in doing this, I changed my perspective on um, how I think about mentorship. So I haven't heard anything in about six minutes in the chat. I wanna make sure that you all are still with me and that you either disagree or you don't disagree. We've only got about uh, 10, 12 minutes left. So let's get to some questions and let's see if you agree or disagree. Uh, I'm gonna actually jump in here because Talha asked a great question. Oh, there you are. You jumped in because yeah. Talha asked a question. Read it to yes. you, sir. So for a junior software engineer, how important is it to be inclusive by knowledge sharing versus just carry on comp completing tickets, building knowledge ATC? Mm, that's a great point because what he's saying is, I still have to do my job. And this gets into hard work versus overwork, right? If you're just learning and you're getting started as a junior, I don't think it's on you to also give talks and also do Stack Overflow and also do blogs. You've got you've to gotta balance yourself out. But again, um, knowledge sharing can be, can be lateral. It can be juniors supporting juniors as well as doing larger knowledge sharing. Uh, it also depends on your personality. I don't think everybody needs to give talks and everyone needs to be a, be a presenter and everyone needs to write blog posts and tweets and stuff. I just think that um, one needs to be intentional. So I would encourage Talha and the folks that are listening to ask themselves, what do I need to be doing right now? And you should ask yourself that maybe once a week, once a month, and it's gonna change depending on how you feel. If you have the energy, and if you don't have the energy, adjust, but don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. Uh, here's another interesting question. Here's a tough one. Christian says, when someone asks you an opinion about somebody and you don't have a great opinion about that person, that's a tough one. Uh, I think that if you can't say something nice, you shouldn't say anything at all. Um, and uh, in doing that, you're actually saying something. So uh, people know, you know, who's a problem and if you don't have a high opinion of someone, but I don't think that it's your job to, as we say in, uh, in English, dunk, dunk on somebody. So I'm not gonna go and dunk on people just because I can. Um, Samuel makes a great point in the chat that silence speaks volumes. So very, very good point. Here's an interesting one here uh, from, uh, from uh, Janice saying, I'm wondering if there's a risk of endorsement devaluation. Are endorsements unlimited? What is the price the endorser pays for the endorsement? This is a fantastic, fantastic question. Let's talk about that for a second. They are unlimited, but it does get devalued if the person you're endorsing does poorly. Because remember, luck is being prepared plus opportunity. I can make unlimited opportunities, but if the person's not prepared, then the luck doesn't happen. And I, as the endorser, look dumb, right? So if a buddy of mine says, hey, can you hook me up for this job? Can you like recommend me for this job? I have to really believe it. I can't just give endorsement because what if they aren't ready? So then I get into a little bit of an awkward situation where I have to be honest with them and say, you know, I'm not comfortable doing that right now. Let's talk about how we can get to the point where I am comfortable. So very, very good question there. Endorsements are effectively unlimited, but you have to use good judgment. I don't give endorsements out every day, but you know when you meet people or you know someone, you're like, this person's going places. When you hear that in your head, when you feel that, you're like, this person's going places. I'm a fan. I want to see how I can help this person. Listen to yourself. That's a moment. That's a moment. And then to Samuel's point, 
help them prepare. But again, if they don't give back, if they're not giving good energy, then they're, uh, we would call them emotional vampires where they just want you to make their work easier. And we saw that earlier with a question where someone was saying, well, what about the work? Um, if, they're, if they're not doing it, then what are you gonna do? This is great. Here's a very tough question from Dimitri. I love this one. How do we make sponsorship possible in a team that is always tight? Now, this is very uncomfortable. What do you do when the bosses are against everything that I just said? What do you think? This is a tough one. If the boss sucks, you're not going to put together a mentorship program, are you? Do you have any thoughts? Well, uh, it's a difficult one. In a way, you should get a win, some sort of win. And then from you can build on that. Uh, it's like I had a similar situation in the past, but before getting the win, it's uh, it's not going to happen because I mean you yeah. need some sort of leverage, and yeah. uh, when you have a leverage, then you can uh, start uh, producing some. I mean, you can start pushing uh, your agenda a little bit more than. Yeah, that's a great point. So finding leverage, I love that one. Samuel says you don't need the boss's permission. This is what we say: ask for forgiveness, don't ask for permission. Mikhail says, or Michael says, do it anyway, unofficially, without asking permission. Christian says, change the company or change the company. Uh, the tough part with that, of course, is that not everybody has the ability to just quit, um, which I think is a tough one. If you have the ability or the privilege to quit, if you're in a place financially with your family where you can actually quit, yeah, you should mm -hmm. probably quit. Change the company or change the company. Um, that's a tough one. This is really good. Um, Andrew says, should everyone on a team effectively be a mentor and share knowledge? This is an awesome question. If it's a healthy team, you're going to naturally be doing that. You're, everyone lifts everyone up. That is a great question from Andrew here saying, is everyone a mentor? Yes. If you're always pairing and you're always hyping each other up and like, good job and let's do this and let's do that. That is a, uh, that is ideal if everyone is mentoring everyone. Talha says, understand what the boss's priorities are. This is great. That's actually called uh, managing up. Yeah. Managing yeah. up is figuring out what your boss needs, putting your brain in their brain, and then giving them what they need. Because oftentimes there's something going on that the boss knows that you don't actually, uh, oh, actually don't know about, which is a very good, uh, very good question. The Nitin has a great question here as well, saying that there's folks that have been working on the team for years, but they still call themselves unexperienced. Sometimes they can have imposter syndrome. They can be a little bit down on themselves. You have to sit down with them. And sometimes what I do is I list out the things that they did that are great. Sometimes people need to be reminded that they do a good job. So you say to someone who is feeling like they didn't do a good job, well, what did you ship last month? Let's look at that. Hey, that's great. That feature looks great. Why aren't you feeling good about it? And remind them. Sometimes you just need to remind your friends and colleagues that they are actually good at their jobs. And that's a nice one. Yeah, it's very interesting because it's like in the heat of the moment, people people often forget how good they are actually. Because in a way, uh, when you cannot like develop a feature, but it's like last month you deliver, uh, you de develop the tons of them, you forget about it. It was like months ago in the past. It's like, uh, and right now you're just, you, you, you forget about it. You really forget about it. It's, 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 then you really need somebody to pinpoint at you. Ah, check yeah. it out. You did a really good job then. Um, Andre Nikolai has a great question that is a tough one because they're saying suggestions on finding a mentor in a small company. So I used to work in a small consulting company. We had 25 people. And what we did, because the group was too small for us to get like fresh perspectives, is we teamed up with a sister company. Have you ever heard the term sister city? Like if you have like a little town in one country and then they have their sister Yes. Down in another one. You can find a sister company. And what you do is you invite them over to give a brown bag lunch. So you have the other company come over for lunch and show what they're working on in a different industry. And then you have knowledge exchange, almost like a sister city. So if you have a company of small 5, 10, 15 people, find another 5, 10, 15 person company that's not a competitor and mm -hmm. have them visit. And then you can meet new people and in doing that, possibly find 
a, uh, another mentor. It's a bit of a life hack there. Very active chat. This is very exciting. I love that there's so many people and people are replying to each other, which is great because people are helping and lift each other up and not just waiting for me to answer the questions, which is fantastic. Hmm. I love it. This is great. We've only got about three minutes left. I feel like I've, um, that people appreciate what I'm trying to say here and they understand the perspective that I'm offering, which makes me happy. I always wonder sometimes if this is going to, uh, you know, to work, you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. yeah. What I want people to be thinking about and what they live, they leave this conversation with is think about what your stories are, how you got into tech, how you can tell stories about dropping databases in production accidentally uh, and all the things that we've all done that can be told to a way that encourages or other early in career people and encourages mentees and try to humanize tech and not make it super negative. And it also teach them to effectively share theirs as well. Um, I love it. Making mistakes is human. There's so many questions and I'm not going to have time. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I am all over social media, my friends. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, on Mastodon. You can find me on TikTok. You can find me on YouTube. Um, people are suggesting we maybe turn this into a workshop. I love that idea. Oh, Ileana has a great question. How do you find a mentor if you're working on startup ideas? I think that there's probably someone who's working on uh, working at a big company, but has dreams of working on a startup. And I think that if you're doing a startup, go to like um, local user groups, at the beginning of the user group, ask a question, say, hey, I'm working on a startup, I'm looking actively for a mentor. This is a place that you can find people. Find someone in a big company who's maybe a CTO or a high level programmer, and they might be thinking, I need, I, I need to mentor someone else. So that's what I would suggest to you, uh, Ileana. Um, Andy is asking a great question about what happens when seniors and technical leads are unwilling to take advice from younger members of the team. You got to overwhelm them with uh, you know, the goodness. There's always going to be some jerk uh, and you've got to figure out some way to change them. Sometimes it needs to come from the top CTO, the CEO, the CXO. Um, uh, that is a very challenging scenario. That's where they need to come to talks like this, hopefully, and get a little bit of empathy. They need to be reminded about uh, empathy. Um, Christian is saying, build your own luck. It's You can build your own luck to a point, but remember, luck is being prepared plus opportunity. You can build um, preparedness. To some degree, you can build um, opportunities, but you can't create opportunities if you can't see them. So I have visibility into opportunities that you don't, and you have visibility into opportunities that I don't. Teaming up is always going to give more results than just simply building, um, building your own luck. And this is great. Dimitri has my final thought of the day. I love that you said this. People are sponsoring and mentoring each other by replying. So if you see a question that I missed or I didn't get a chance to reply to, maybe offer your perspective and reply to it in the Slack. And I wanna say thank you to our friends at uh, DevTrinity for having me here. And I am so glad that you are here. Thank you very much. I will see you, see you all uh, in a little later. Thank you very much, Scott. All right, bye-bye.